What happens when you take a dash of Crusader Kings, smear it with some oxygen not included style graphics, add all kinds of builder and production chain management, and track every single individual like it's RimWorld? Watch on and find out. My name is Thorax, and this is Strategy for Busy People. If you've got a few minutes, I'll tell you what to play. After a short hiatus, we're back. Somehow, Norland by Long Jaunt missed my radar initially. When a coworker mentioned it recently, I saw the quote-unquote medieval Rimworld descriptor and wanted to give it a try, as Rimworld itself has been on my list for quite some time. I spent just over eight hours in this strategic simulation city builder thing? Note that it's been several months since I've played Norland, and the game has seen quite a few updates since then, so take some of this review with a grain of salt. Norland puts you in the management seat of a kingdom slash alliance. I say slash here because you get to choose which type of game you will play. You are in charge of this situation in a godlike mode. You can give direct orders to your lords and nobles, which they will eventually follow. But every single individual in the game is tracked and has personality, desires, and more. Managing this complex web of relationships and needs is actually an extremely important part of the game. If your peasants or lords are not happy, they don't perform as well and may even start to do bad things. The homeless might become vagabonds or worse, as an example. Your lords need their hanky-panky time, and not having a spouse can leave them feeling distracted and lustful. In some cases, you can send them on dates with visitors. It's a complex web, for sure. With respect to the city building and production management aspects of the game, your workers gather resources in a typical fashion. You have a woodcutter to chop trees, and farmers to grow crops, and then production buildings to transform some of those crops. The interesting additional mechanic is that your lords have to give instructions to each production facility once every few days. Their management skill influences the total quantity of production, and a facility that has not received instructions in several days will actually suffer a dramatic performance penalty. After all, if those peasants don't have a lord telling them what to do and how to do it, will they even do it? There's only so much time in the day, though, and your lords may have other duties like visiting neighboring territories, more on that later, going on dates, etc., at some point, a lord can't take on any more management jobs, and you can only have so many lords at one time. There is a special building, the Chancellery, that takes paper and requires a single lord to be there all day. The Chancellery sends out orders via workers and can manage many, many more buildings than a lord can do on their own. But anyway... Another interesting mechanic is that at first, you cannot build all of the building types in the game. There isn't a tech tree, so to speak, but buildings and other buffs are granted by the knowledge that is contained in books. Your lords are literate, and they can spend some of their time reading books and learning what is contained in them. If a lord learns the pig farm knowledge, you can then build a pig farm. But beware, people can and do die in this game, sometimes just of old age, and their knowledge would die with them. Having multiple lords knowing a thing is important. I won't even go into the whole subsystem of the visiting trader and the books and writing books on paper, and man, there's a lot here. At the end of the day, your people gather in the city center to eat and drink and socialize, and then go to bed. Your peasants get paid a wage for working, as do your soldiers and even the homeless. If they can buy food and booze, they are happy and well-rested. But if they can't afford either and have to go without for too long, they may suffer fatigue, which impacts their work performance. Speaking of soldiering, there are a number of interesting systems related to combat. You can hire mercenaries or loyalist peasants to join your army. Your lords can lead them into combat, either against neighbors or sometimes to defend your own area against bandits or even wolf-like creatures. Hiring soldiers costs money in the form of wages, but also in the form of taxes that must be paid on how combat-worthy your troops are. Your troops need special housing in the form of barracks, just like your regular peasants need housing in the form of dormitories and peasant houses. Even your lords have a special housing type, too. 
When it comes to those neighbors in a simplified Crusader Kings-like way, you manage the relationship between your king and their kings or queens. The more a neighbor likes you, the easier it will be to have them join an alliance, enter into trade agreements, or do other things. There are many political games you can play to increase or decrease both your relationship with neighboring rulers, but also those rulers' relationships with one another. In my first playthrough, I chose to go the alliance route as opposed to forging a kingdom through force. Sometimes a neighboring territory was already in an alliance with a different ruler. By building my relationship with the target territory and then using the slander mission, I could influence a negative relationship between the target territory and its alliance head, thus causing the target ruler to abandon the alliance and then leaving them open for me to offer my alliance in its stead. These are just some examples of complex systems that exist in this game. The reality is that I'm barely scratching the surface here. And when you start a new playthrough, there are a lot of different levers you can pull to influence the overall game experience. Before I give my final verdict, take a moment to like this video and subscribe to the channel. Don't forget to share it with your friends. Agree with me, disagree with me, or want to see other content? Let me know in the comments below. Want to try this game yourself? Check out my humble affiliate link below. And if you want to support me in making more of these videos, become a patron on Patreon. Your support really makes a difference. The Final Verdict While this game has a tremendous amount of complexity, it never really feels all that overwhelming. Things are mostly straightforward, but sometimes you'll just want to scum save and use some trial and error to see what happens when you do a thing. I didn't stop playing because I hated the game or ran into some crazy blockers. Honestly, for being an early access title, this game is very complete and I had nearly no issues worth mentioning. Anything I didn't understand, I hopped into the official Discord help channel and they usually helped me figure it out. On my trademarked three point score scale of avoid, meh, and I forgot to eat, there were plenty of gross rutabagas turned into moonshine, and the pigs were slaughtered for everyone's merriment, even if they did toss ten coins each. But the feat was a tasty treat, as was this game overall, and it is worth your investigation. But that being said, this game gives rutabaga a bad rap. Those things are actually quite tasty when you roast them or saute them well.